Can we find Jill? Can we find Jill? There he is. Excellent. Somewhere there, but uh, I see it differently than normal. Oh well. I, I believe you're seeing uh, the screen view because Cameron is sharing something on the screen. So that's why you'll see our the panel on the side. There we are. But it doesn't just doesn't work like the one this morning where it shows you all the participants. No, we're in webinar mode, which is different oh, okay. than the meeting mode. Yeah. All right. Are we ready to go? I think so. So welcome everyone to your chamber's second virtual town hall with our elected to officials from each level of government. I'm Keitha Robson, I'm the CAO of your chamber, and I'm going to uh, try to act as our moderator today as we continue to shelter in place. And now, as some business begin to slowly reopen, every business in our community will continue to be subject to rapid government legislation and support mechanisms as they are implemented. When the chamber engages with elected officials, it provides our members with the opportunity to speak to the government directly. And all of our advocacy work that we undertake on your behalf depends on the input that we receive from all of you, our business owners. No other organization better understands the impact this crisis has had on small businesses in our community who do so much to support our charities, our sports teams, our nonprofits, and indeed our tax base. In an effort to ensure that you remain informed with the most up-to-date and accurate information, we are pleased to facilitate this second in our virtual town hall series to learn how each level of government plans to continue to support you through this pandemic time. The Chamber continues to actively maintain a business information toolkit, which you can find on our website, and that's where we store our government-funded resources information. You can visit that at timmonschamber.on.ca for more information. Our Policy and Engagement League, Cameron Grant, is on hand to receive your questions during this virtual town hall, and I would ask that you submit your questions in the chat box you see on the side of your screen could be at your bottom, depending on the device that you're using. Please note that we will do our best to answer your questions as time permits, and that all questions will be recorded and shared with each respective government representative. To our friends in the media, this town hall is being recorded, and should you wish to acquire the recording, please reach out to Cameron via email. And thank you for ensuring that our community receives accurate and timely information during these unprecedented times. I would like to begin by thanking our Mayor George Peary, MPP Jill Bissell, and MP Charlie Angus for joining us today. And so that we respect the time, we are going to jump right into the Q&A portion of our town hall. So, <coughs> Jill sounds like he's ready. Okay. I already sent you a question. Yeah, I see that first question. How come Keith is doing such a good job? I don't know, Jill. It's just I don't know what you're doing. doing a... Thanks, no, but Jill. Also, can I, can I just say before we start, sure uh, the Chamber has been doing an excellent job of bringing people together, not just in this format, but other formats, in order to be able to talk about how our small business community is better able to deal with what's going on in this uh, particular pandemic, and also the larger player in the mining sector. So it's very appreciated. Good work. Well, we appreciate uh, all of your interaction as well. I've, I've spent more time with you all in the last two months than I have in the last two years. And it's, uh, it's, it's been healthy for our business uh, community as well, because I feel like we're getting a lot of results for them. So thank you for your participation and cooperation. Um, one of our questions, and I'm not, I'm not sure if any of you can uh, answer this one, but about the current unemployment rate in Timmins and area in terms of percentages and numbers, and how does it compare to pre-COVID? I'm not sure if that's a number that the mayor may get from the Economic Development Corporation on a regular basis, but George, do you have any thoughts oh, on where we might find that? I don't have an up-to-date number on that. I know that we're very fortunate in that our, can you hear me? We that, can. Okay. Um, that our largest employers have stayed in business. So we haven't seen the effects, uh, you know, the kids and, and uh, Lakeshores or uh, Newmont, as well as school boards, so the, the two school boards, the uh, Northern College, Royal College, and others are all still uh, gainfully employed and, and paid. Um, city of Timmins, we've had, some, we've had some reductions here as well within the City of Timmins. Um, so I expect our unemployment rate will be will be up, um, but I felt fairly good uh, about those so far. Um, I shouldn't say felt fairly good. I felt I felt that the the, the initiatives within the, the 
with the federal government especially, um, the number of different programs they have available. Um, I, I felt very, fairly confident that there's money in pockets. Um, so hence, you know, the sooner we get out of this, the better we'll be. Agreed. Jill, did you have a comment to add on that? No, I think the, the you know, unfortunately, the ones that are really hurt in the small business sector, uh, people in the restaurant business and various retail businesses that have been affected. And for a lot of people, that's their only job. So uh, for those business owners and for those individuals, obviously a difficult thing. But I think the federal government did the right thing with that $2,000 a month. That's helped a lot of people to be able to sort of, you know, work our way through this. And some of the assistance has been provided to small business, probably not as much as, much as what's needed, but it certainly has been a step in the right direction. There's no doubt there will be people that are falling through the cracks, but it's a pretty wide net that's been cast. Yeah, we've been very busy with people uh, re needing the $2,000 a month. It's certainly cut across all, all manner of um, industries. We've dealt a lot with small business. Um, it certainly has stabilized things. Um, the latest, what we don't have all the details yet, is that there's been a number of layoffs at KL Gold that'll be affecting the mines, uh, Taylor Mine, mines uh, near Matheson and that, uh, and maybe in KL. And so there could be a couple of hundred layoffs that coming there. So we don't know if that'll have a spin-off effect, if it's short-term, long-term. It's still, uh, we're still trying to get all the information in, but that will have a bit of a, an impact. But overall, um, we seem to be holding. So for the actual most current unemployment rate, I'm sure we could probably get those numbers from Service Canada. So we, we will try to uh, follow up with that question uh, a little bit later on uh, after this broadcast. Uh, Mr. Mayor, first question is one of municipal uh, interest. So as of today, we know that some businesses have been allowed to open slowly and safely. Um, in a, a limit, limited capacity and as enforcement efforts are under the city's responsibilities, do you have any suggestions on how best business can communicate to ensure they are abiding, by, how we best can communicate to business to assure they are abiding by provincial directives? Yeah, the directives haven't changed, uh, Keith, as you know. Um, the directions are still six feet, um, small, small gatherings. You know, if, if you take a look at Yiggs, for instance, they've got their nursery set up, or they, at least this morning they were setting up their nursery, um, and they should, be, they should be following the very same uh, procedures that they follow for the grocery stores, limited edition, and make no mistake about it, uh, the individual uh, vendors, store operators, are all responsible for, uh, uh, for ensuring the safety of their workers and the safety of, of, of the, the clients. Um, enforcement is only needed, our bylaw of course is out there and they're only needed uh, or will attend when they're, when they're called. They are doing general um, tours, I don't want to call them patrols. Uh, so far very very happy, there's been no fines levied, it's all been educational. Very, very same with our TPS as well, it's all been educational. Um, and it's exactly, I, I think when we first, the, the very first uh, virtual town hall we had, we said where we want to get to is, is not any kind of enforcement, uh, is in fact that it's, it's um, uh, these measures are put in place voluntarily um, by, by, the, by the vendors and the businesses. And they, and, and they, have, to, and they have been. For all uh, that we heard this morning about one kind of lone wolf uh, car dealership. So they will we'll be sending uh, re reminders out to them vis-a-vis uh, -vis our bylaw enforcement officers to take a, take a look at what's going on there. And occasionally we've had one, one uh, a problem with one of our largest retailers in the in the area, and but I think they they swung around as well. So that's um, the message is the very same. The message has not changed. It's doing exactly the same, uh, uh, practicing exactly the same uh, uh, distancing lineups and everything else that have been in place now for seems like forever, but I think it's just a couple months. Did uh, either uh, Jill or Charlie have anything to add to uh, well, thoughts, around thoughts around that? Yeah, just so that people understand the process is that the municipality in this case is responsible for the enforcement uh, uh, in regards of somebody's breaking those rules. But the, the, the conditions as to when you're going to open your business and how you're going to open your business is actually determined by the province. 
Uh, each province has the authority to do that uh, because under the emergency um, under the emergency uh, legislation that was put in place, given the province the opportunity, the ability to do this, uh, they decide when businesses are going to close and we're gonna go, when they're going to reopen. Both those decisions, I have to say, are guided by the public health uh, people. Uh, the Chief Medical Officer of Health of Ontario uh, cleared the list that was given for this morning in the way that it was. So I know that there's, I've seen a couple of articles or there's gardening centers for the people upset that they weren't able to uh, go into the stores and browse and look at all of the various uh, goods that are up for sale because it's a curbside pickup. Uh, so uh, that is a decision that was made as a result of information provided by the Chief Medical Officer of Health and has done in order to keep people safe. Uh, so we'll see more open as time goes on, but it'll be a very gradual, slow thing. And I'll just say this one last thing. Notice in the province of Quebec, they were to open up their economy in some areas a little bit sooner. Uh, I read this, uh, this afternoon that in fact, Quebec has pushed back a little bit to the 18th of May, some of those openings in Montreal. So even where they've been more aggressive to open earlier, uh, there is a sort of a, a pushback by the public to say, hey, let's get this right. Because if you don't get it right, we're going to have more infections and we'll keep the economy shut down even longer. So it's really important from a safety perspective, but also an economic perspective, we get it right. So I, I recall uh, someone this morning referring to this as a graduation day for some local businesses. And, and our uh, next question is uh, still on this is uh, still on this thread. Um, as businesses are now starting to open, as we said, in, in a way that they have to in a responsible and safe way. Um, what do we think will happen with funding and support for those local businesses? Um, will that continue? Because, you know, some of our members have concerns that while the funding was, the immediate funding was there, funding to get them on their feet may not be there. So what, what are we hearing is going to be the, the levels of support that may continue beyond graduation day? Well, um, yeah, certainly one of the issues that we've been really pushing, um, with the government on and our negotiations back and forth have been very fruitful uh, has been on the need for flexibility. Uh, initially, we were, I mean, trying to, you know, deal with the, the massive shock to the system. One of the issues, for example, in the CERB was a $2,000 a month, but the initial provision was you couldn't work. Well, some people get some income, some people get an honorarium, would they be kicked off? There would be no incentive for them to do anything. So we got that support so that they could actually start to earn some income. So self-employed and that could still maintain some contracts. The issue of repayment of the uh, lo no interest loans and that have been stretched out so that people can will still be able to use it. Right now, the wage subsidy will still be in place. And we're going to we're going to monitor uh, where we're going to be, but uh, I think the the expectation in government is we had to be ready to 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 be supporting this at least until October, even though some of the uh, provisions don't extend that far. But the horizon is is that we're not going to get out of this very quickly. Uh, there's going to need to be a, a, a steady buildup, but we have to have supports in place. It will probably mean us going back to Parliament to vote some on more provisions if 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 we have to extend it. But nobody is suggesting that we just um, hit the wall and say, "Okay, end of support. You're on your you're on your own." We we know that it's not the reopening and the rebuilding of the economy is not going to happen like that. It's going to require that support for some time. Yeah, and can I can I just add, Keith? Uh, we uh, part of our meeting this morning that we had with the chamber, uh, we we looked over the uh, the survey that was done by the Timmins Economic Development Corporation, and the biggest impediment for people not applying is not knowing about what's available or how to apply. Uh, so, when in doubt, ask questions. Get a hold of the chamber. Get a hold of the TEDC or offices, uh, Charlie or I, and we can point you in the right direction because there are some uh, programs available. And what was interesting in that step that survey, there was a vast number of people didn't know exactly how to apply. So if in doubt, shout as they say. Yes, and, and we encourage uh, our business community to use all the resources that they have available to them. And there's uh, a number of business support organizations in the community willing to do that. So uh, give us a call and we'll try and direct you to the right place for sure. Mm -hmm. All right, I see another question here about uh, federal and provincial levels of government have tabled a number, number of programs to assist 
residents and small businesses. Um, what steps aside from less than clear deferral of arrears on property taxes? Okay, so this sounds like it might be for uh, Mayor Peary. Um, so property taxes are coming due immediately after the restrictions are lifted. I'm, I guess around the same time. So is the municipality looking at the deferral or elimination maybe of property yeah, tax yeah, bills? I think we've been very, very clear. And that's, we've deferred any, any interest payments on overdue uh, property taxes. Um, so if you don't pay your property taxes, you won't be charged interest on any balance that's outstanding. And as, as, as we've published already a couple of times, already a $4 million hole, um, both from a shortfall of revenues and increase, increasing expenses. But uh, I think what the city has done is very well, it's, it's published, it's online, we've been uh, transparent in everything that we're doing. Um, and we're obviously, we're obviously in a situation of some concern ourselves. Yes, and I, and I know a number of businesses have uh, contacted the city treasurer uh, directly and uh, and got some clarity. So if there are there are some issues that where things remain unclear for any of our business community, I'm sure uh, the mayor would extend uh, Natalie's phone number for everyone. We will show her this recording. <laughs> oh, you went on mute or something. Yeah. Hello. Keith, come back. I'm back. I'm back. I'm back. Sorry. Where sorry. I double clicked the wrong clicker. Okay. So um, we we spoke briefly about this this morning in our task force, Jill, and I'm just wondering. Um, so the Chamber Network has been calling on leaders to immediately execute in order to block commercial evictions uh, for a period of the next two weeks. Uh, moratorium on evictions will allow CMHC the time to um, implement the Canada Emergency Commercial Rent Assistance Program because we know that's there, there's a program there, but it's just timing, and as well as time for the uh, CWS money to begin flowing. So how do we help push this ask? So uh, as we know, on the, on the individual side, there is a moratorium. They can't, you can't evict anybody at this point uh, because that's been precluded uh, by putting in a place to freeze. We don't have the same thing for commercial rents, and that's a real problem, <clears throat> especially in areas where the market is hot in some downtowns it means that the owner of the building will use this as a way to vacate the building uh, in order to re-rent later to somebody else for maybe more money uh, so it's creating a lot of problems and we have been talking to the government about in fact uh, putting in place a moratorium on evictions for commercial rents as well uh, so we're currently in discussions with the provincial government about that uh, and hopefully the government will see its way the actual rent subsidy i'll let charlie speak to because it's mostly federal dollars, but the difficulty with that program, it's the landlord that has to apply for the money and not the tenant, which makes it very complicated for nothing. So I'll let Charlie speak to that. Yeah, that's a very good question because uh, we pushed for this so that we would not be uh, having businesses facing that stress coming in by the 1st of May. Uh, the government decision to have the landlords apply for it, uh, I think is more complicated. It also does allow for sometimes unscrupulous practices, and I'm not going to say it's happening in our region, but I know that we've heard of it in other regions, as she'll pointed out, where there is an incentive to not uh, apply for it uh, and then put notice that you'll be having someone removed, uh, even though the there's a stay on eviction now uh, with with families, but biz businesses could be affected. So. So I, I think what we're needing to do with this is to come back to come back to the uh, to the minister and say we have people who want to pay their rent, who want to maintain viable. If their landlord's not doing it, there's got to be a way that the tenant can do it, and so that they are protected and their uh, their rights are maintained. So this is something we're 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 going to be bringing back to government. We've had to tweak a lot of things with these programs. This is definitely one of them that's on our list of things that need tweaking. And this is where we have appreciated the ability to uh, work with all of you to point out when things do need tweaking. All right, so my next question is back to the mayor and it's one of our uh, 
common, common discussions in deferral, so we can talk about this, but um, one of our members is wondering about, of course, the municipal accommodation tax, because it was a new tax that was implemented uh, just last year, and some um, across the chamber network, some municipalities are being asked to postpone or cancel the collection of the tourism marketing or accommodation tax as we know it. Um, just because our accommodation industry is one of the hardest hit during the pandemic along with a lot of our uh, tourism uh, businesses. And while we know the city, is, city of Timmins has allowed the sector to defer the tax, it, it would be ideal from this business's perspective if they would be able to retain those funds as a grant to the business during this time and if there's been any consideration of this. So those businesses are collecting the tax during their time of operation in a less than ideal uh, situation. Would they be allowed to keep that directly and infuse it into their tourism business? So that's the question. Uh Probably unlikely. We haven't discussed this at council. We haven't discussed this internally. Um, we, I thought the question initially when it was originally asked, uh, would they even have to collect it? But if they want to collect it and put it directly into their into their pockets, I'm not entirely sure that that would be. It's it uh, uh, that 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 would be uh, looked at favorably with the council, but we haven't discussed that. So yes, to right now the properties have been asked to continue to collect it but not remit it. They've been allowed to defer the payment to the municipality of it to date. Um, so that's that's the question I guess they asked to council. So maybe something, uh, maybe something more uh, concrete from our uh, accommodations group could uh, be presented to council just for consideration to see if that's something that we could look at as a next step to the deferral. So we will take that back as homework. All right, um, Charlie, we're wondering yes. a question here about working with the Bank of Canada to encourage the use of monetary policy um, in complement with fiscal measures to preserve economic viability of businesses. So um, how are we going to, um, you know, get the uh, economy, I guess, back uh, in into the hands of business, because right now it's in the hands of government, really. Well, I think it's going to be uh, an understanding to get the economy fully back up will require uh, a major social investment uh, after the damage that we've seen that's been done by COVID. Um, and certainly we're, we've seen many industries are looking to government right now for help and we'll be asking for help. So where does that mean in terms of fiscal policy with the Bank of Canada, with uh, what does it mean for our debt? Uh, I've actually been meeting with a number of experts on this and Kevin Page, our former parliamentary budget officer who has uh, the uh, Institute for Fiscal uh, and Social Democracy uh, at the University of Ottawa says the good news is with interest rates being almost flat, almost at zero, it does give the federal government enormous latitude that they didn't have in other recessions um, to actually put money into the economy. So our ability to uh, spend money is, is very much different than it was in the 80s and the 90s when we were paying much higher levels of interest and it was very crushing. We have a much lower uh, debt to GDP ratio uh, than many of the other um, G7 countries. So it's going to take, uh, I think, a realistic investment in terms of a series of um, federally supported initiatives to, to, to rebuild the economy at this point. And I would say, and I'm not, I'm not making promises to the mayor, but we know that the municipalities are taking a huge burden we know that the provinces are facing a lot of financial issues. We may be looking at uh, working on infrastructure projects where we have to change the traditional, you know, 30, 30, 30, or one third, one third, one third investments to get economic development happening and to do that in a, a smart way. So I think that uh, we're looking at, um, 
a rebuild that's going to take us maybe two years, maybe years to, to years get there, and the Feds are going to have to expect to, to, to play a big part. My, my issue is making sure that if we're spending money, we're spending it right. The last thing I want to see is an army of members of parliament running around with white hard hats on and paper checks, cutting ribbons, this, there, and everywhere. We should do smart investments. We should make sure that we come out of this in a, in a more resilient manner. So we're never in a situation again where we were as unprepared as we were. But the Bank of Canada and low interest rates will certainly play a big part in the toolkit that has to be applied by the federal government to do smart investments to get us uh, and get our economy our moving economy. again. Uh, one of our guests is asking if there has been any discussion at the federal level of reducing the tax on withdrawing RSPs to, as we reopen the economy, because that they feel that that would inject large amounts of monies into the economy. That's an excellent question, and uh, right when the crisis started, I had a number of people asking me uh, that, and it was certainly something I know that the government wasn't looking at at the time because we were very much focused on the crisis mode. The government is very wary of uh, lowering uh, and making it easier to pull RSPs out for a number of reasons. This may be one of the tools that they, they, they consider, especially if that money is going to be used uh, to help businesses. So this will be part of the negotiations. Is this a tool that would help? Uh, can we do this so that we make sure that the benefits um, to business, uh, to individuals, to our society is is, is measurable. Uh, I think it's a very worthy suggestion. It's definitely something I'll be bringing back to our finance people. Great, good to hear. Um, Mr. Mayor, I, I guess this could be a question for uh, for uh, Mr. Mayor and Mr. MPP. So there's a question actually on our Facebook about the fire ban. So we know it's not necessarily a business issue, but um, is there any discussion about what the what the rollout of the fire ban will be? So, Mary, you start this hot potato. <laughs> oh, it's, I guess I'm it's, okay. It's, yeah, <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, lift the fire ban. The fire ban, I think, was put in by the the province. So, Jill, this is over to you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I knew this was going to happen. <laughs> I, I get, listen, the, the one thing that we're passionate about as Northerners is the outdoors. And uh, people are looking, listen, I want to be able to sit in my backyard at home, have a little fire, enjoy the company of my family and friends uh, that are able to, to, get, to get together. And uh, people are lucky enough to be able to be in a position where things are open, uh, to be able to get into the bush and camp and do those type of things. <clears throat> so listen, the reason the province did this <clears throat> is pretty simple, is in the middle of a pandemic, the last thing that the province want is the, uh, the, uh, the possibility that there's forest fires that are started as a result of uh, for, uh, campfires that have gotten out of control. And as we know, there's a lot of those that happen. And in the middle of a pandemic, the province didn't want to be in a position uh, to have to deal with that because as a whole, how do you keep fire crews safe? Uh, do we have the uh, resources even to do it? So that's why it was put in place. Uh, I think uh, it's been raised so many times by, uh, to, by all of Northerners and some central Ontario people to MPPs that it's something that we've gone back to the Minister of Natural Resources and to the Solicitor General with and to say, is there a way that we can deal with a couple of things? First thing is, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> if there is a campfire, is there some conditions that we can set to allow people to do that? They haven't responded yet in a positive way, but it's something before them. The other one is being able to launch your boat this, uh, this month of May, whenever the ice comes off the lake, which it's still on. Uh, because my understanding, and I'd like to know from the mayor, because the province has shut down its access points, <clears throat> but apparently the municipalities have not. And I'm, I'm quite frankly, a little bit confused about that. I, I don't know why it's been done that way. And the last part is uh, campsites uh, being able to be in a position, hopefully in some not too distant future, to impose some sort of restrictions of what you can do in campsites so that people can get out to their camps, into their trailers and enjoy the outdoors as we move into the springtime. Yeah, I don't know what boat launches you're talking about, Jill, because I think we have one, and I think MRC has one. And last time I checked, mm -hmm. the, the city was and MRC was uh, following the, the regulations that stipulated by the provinces, and it was barricaded. It's not again. This isn't a city decision. This is this is a rule that the provinces put in place, 
And uh, so barricades went up on the back of the provinces. I mean, the city very definitely in all this is, it, we support the health unit. And, uh, you know, as you know, we're a child of the, of the, our legislation is lack of is A very nice child, though, I must say. Yeah. <laughs> so we're, uh, we, uh, we, a lot of, you know, and all of these things simply do as we're told. Yeah, no, I realize, and I'm not trying to pass the buck on to you, George, but uh, somebody was telling me, and I didn't get a chance to check with you, that apparently municipalities are dealt with differently. I'm not aware of that, so that's why we're just raising it. Well, you've been in government a long time, a lot longer than I have, Jill, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, I just want to say, I, I really look forward to the day that the fire ban comes off. I look at our fire pit and I think how beautiful it would be, but I understand, and it's hard, but I understand the last thing the province wants is a fire at this time. So uh, this, is, this is one of the ways that we all have to do our part, but uh, when that fire ban comes off, I'll be a very happy person. And so will I. I would love to have my fire pit going as well. So uh, there's not even an inkling of when this ban may be lifted, but we can say provincial parks aren't even opening at least until after May 31st. So is it fair to expect that we won't see a, a lift of that until that time, Jill? I don't know. They, we're, we're trying to get them to use a bit of reason and common sense is that, you know, in your backyard in Tim, it's not likely to start a forest fire, right? Yeah. So is there a way for people to use chimneys, you know, those, those self-contained units, in a way that's safe. So we're trying to get them to see if they're willing to do that. And it's not just myself, it's every Northern MPP, every Central Ontario MPP, Southwest, Southeast, except for the city of Toronto, it's an issue everywhere. <clears throat> All right, well, this week we are uh, seeing a local PPE drive uh, happening in our community for our frontline workers. And the next question is about that. It is about understanding that uh, businesses are going to need to be able to access adequate PPE along with updated guidelines and education on proper use and other health and safety considerations related to combating COVID-19 so that they are able to appropriately reopen and is how is the province or the municipality looking to support businesses in that purchase and education? Yeah so th there's there's two streams the first one is there is a provincial stream by which uh, PPEs are uh, distributed across the province by region. We're part of the northern region, so there's a northern regional table that deals with that. It's called the northern supply chain. And they've been very helpful in sourcing PPE equipment so that we can keep a couple of weeks stock at places like hospital, long-term care facilities, EMS, police, et cetera. The bigger challenge is what do you do in all those workplaces that are going to need more and more PPEs as we open up? Uh, so the province has put in place a pretty efficient and fast-track process for entrepreneurs who are wanting to get into the business of, uh, of producing and selling PPEs to the Ontario, the Canadian, the international market. We actually have people here in Timmins who have applied to that process and they're actually pretty far into the uh, approval process where they would get into the supply chain, but also they would get some financial assistance uh, to be able to do that. So the province is ramping up the production of PPEs here in Ontario so that we don't have to rely on Mr. Trump to say we can get our 3M masks or uh, uh, the Chinese or whoever it might be. So uh, we're going in that direction. And unfortunately, I think this is, this is me, me and my little hobby horse. Inter internationalism is good. You know, we went the way of NAFTA, free trade, world trade organizations, and it's a global economy. But I think this proves there's certain things that you have to do in your local economy and your provincial and national economy that are crucial to the safety of your nation and your province, and this is one of them. And that's why a lot of this stuff should actually be produced here in Canada or Ontario. Yeah, there's no doubt that the supply chain is going to be reinvented at the end of this, uh, Keith. Um, in relation to local efforts in coordinating PPE, that's, been, that's being done through our emergency response team with uh, Tom Lauder. I think you're, you're speaking most, mostly about uh, individual vendors. We talked about that this morning and there's, there's various types of masks, uh, of course, that will be available whether they're, whether they're a cloth mask, where it's a surgical mask, or whether it's an, any variant of KN95 or a, or a N95 masks, which are really the, the top end of the line. Our, our, uh, our uh, local um, large, uh, 
employers have been incredibly de generous in donating thousands and thousands of, of, uh, of these masks. Um, and, and I think we're in relatively good shape. Um, I think when it comes to open the various levels of retail, um, you'll see in our, in our town right now, there's, there's lots of individuals uh, uh, walking around with, with homemade masks, cloth masks and such. And uh, some of them, I mean, even are, are decorated with, with football logos, you know. Uh, so, uh, so, you know, people are I'm being decorated. Like a certain chamber president, he might have one of those. Yeah, somebody about the Patriots. People are very, very creative with their, with their styles. Um, and I, uh, again, I must say, even, even uh, uh, local, local families that were, were teaching, teaching sewing, uh, are are uh, are extending that service, so they're they're making masks. There's there's been an incredible sense of um, of volunteerism and, and entrepreneurship when it when it comes to these masks. I think people are having a lot of fun with it. I don't expect that at a local level there be any shortage of, of masks at all. And I sh I love the way the community responded to this uh, to this challenge. Um, I, I wanted to add term, in terms of the big picture and where we go from here because we've seen an incredible outpouring of support. Um, uh, but we should never ever in be a situation again where we have to crowdsource for the medical supplies that we need to keep us safe. I think that's the lesson that we've learned. The fact that, you know, we trusted uh, the global supply chain and we had emergency equipment seized by the American president in a political stunt while we were still honoring our international obligations and sending supplies to the United States as well as nurses. We don't want to ever be in that situation again. And we see the capacity in Canada to, to step up. Uh, certainly, you know, Compass and, and Kit is a great example. There was a need. Our people stood up. Uh, we're talking to manufacturers in southern Western Ontario Who've, who've been hit hard over the last number of years, who are stepping up, stepping into the breach. It's going to require a major national conversation at the end of the day. It's, it's a conversation that's going on in Australia right now where they've decided to be in an island continent. They never, ever want to be caught uh, again uh, without the kind of supplies that would keep them safe. That is going to be a reasonable conversation, conversation in the coming years, and, coming and years it will also and build a stronger and more stronger diversified more economy. Diversified These are things economy. that we need to learn lessons coming out of COVID, and we have to bring them in in terms of policy to make sure that our, our society, our health system, our economy is sustainable because we don't know if COVID is going to come back for round two, round three, round four, round five. We don't know what's coming, but what we know is where we were. We were not prepared and we don't want to be in that situation again. So the supplies that will be needed by business will be enormous and they should have them and they should be made by Canadians. By Canadians. And, and the sad part, in, in the last SARS outbreak, there was actually a lot of work that was done in that way in order to stockpile masks, surgical gowns, different stuff that we need. And unfortunately, a time expired because you only can keep that stuff for so long until you have to replace it in governments of different stripe. And this is not pointing the finger at the one particular government. Uh, they decided not to renew the stocks. And that's part of the reason. Let's hope that this time we actually learn a lesson. Well, and there will be a, a new cost to doing business because of the PPE requirements for many industries that did not prior to the pandemic have the the requirement for those things to be in place so you know we need to help them a maybe with a, a, some funding in order to 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 learn these skills themselves i think is is the question as well like how do they how do they learn where do they get it they don't even know so i mean we'll figure it out but we'll have to work together to support them in doing it all right, so the next question is about, well, of course, the framework. So, Jill, you're up. So, we are eager to understand the timeline of the plan, but recognize this timing will be dependent on coordination um, with public health officials, other levels of government, and the business community. What action are you undertaking to see the framework put in place? So, you know, maybe you can share what you can about how the how the provincial government will be operating and what things need to happen in order for there to be more of the framework implemented. Yeah, well, first of all, I, you know, the, the, the provincial government isn't wrong when they say, listen, 
we don't want to just open on arbitrary dates. This has to be driven by science, by data, by experience uh, to make sure that we get it right. Because the cost is not only will lives be lost if we open too early and you know the spread gets worse, it's going to keep the economy closed down even that much longer. So we need to make sure that we ramp up in a, you know, in a methodical way that we don't end up uh, making things worse by opening them up. So that's the first thing. Uh, I've been doing a lot of work along with MPPs across all of Ontario. I'm not the only one where we're being contacted by our business community. For example, a couple of weeks ago, I was contacted by the car dealerships. Uh, you couldn't test drive a car. You couldn't walk into a showroom, but you can go into the grocery store and get a pound of meat. Uh, so not that the car dealerships wanted you know, unlimited access, but they wanted something in place that allow their customers to be able to do what they have to do in a safe way. So what a lot of us have been doing as members is dealing with both the ministers responsible and the regulatory body. And in the case of the uh, car dealerships, uh, we got them to give a, a, a partial opening that happened this morning. And we've been working on that for a couple of weeks so that uh, you're able to open in a limited way in your showroom by appointment only, that there's test drives that are able to be done with certain measures to make sure that cars are sanitized once somebody's taken it out for a test drive. And the same thing in other sectors. I've been doing a lot of work because we're Northerners. Everybody wants to go camping. Uh, who owns a camper who doesn't want to go in the bush by the May run weekend? If you can find one in Timmins, uh, I, would be, uh, I would be surprised if, if, if there was anybody who didn't want to do that. Uh, so we've been working at trying to find a way with the government uh, is there a way we can do this safely? Is there a way that we can do a partial opening in some of these? And so far, the government is a little bit reluctant to go there. I think what you said a little while ago, Keith, is right. If they're not opening up provincial parks until a lot, at least May 31st, that's probably where they're going to land. But that's, that's where we spend all of our time as local members. Uh, the other thing I just want to say, the Northern members have been meeting as a group, and most of them, of course, New Democrats, I've uh, been meeting as a group and trying to strategize how we can work together on all of these things, boat launches, et cetera, et cetera, how you're able to shop safely uh, in different, uh, different uh, uh, parts of the retail sector. So things are being done. We saw some small steps taken today, and I'm sure others are down there are coming down the road. So just to be clear, the current state of emergency for the province is until May the 12th, which... Yeah you know, May will be reevaluated. Well, it's not reevaluated. We're actually returning to the House on May the 12th. I'm just actually in negotiations with the government as the House leader on that. Uh, and we're going to pass a, pass a motion in order to give the government yet again the ability to maintain these emergency uh, powers for the time being. And you can only do it for 30 days at a time. That's the way the legislation is done. And, uh, you know, as long as we're cautious, we're going to get there. But let's not run into, the, you know, into problems by opening up things too early. All right. Anyone have anything to add? Here I, I would I would add that in fact, you know, I, I was the one this morning that said that we've been, you know, going to school with this COVID nineteen for a couple of months and as we open up business it's it's really is graduation day. I think collectively our citizens are are, are very wise. I think that They'll know when they walk into a business that's being reopened, whether it's, it's safe or not. I, I really have a lot of faith that they'll back away, that they'll say, hey, this isn't safe. I'm not doing this. You're not, you're not practicing social distances because the message has not changed from day one. That this is the only thing we can do to keep ourselves safe. And ultimately, I think that the, uh, that the, uh, the citizens know that they're the author of their own, uh, own destiny here. They uh, are strong enough and have the, ability to, have the ability to walk away from any situation that they think is unsafe. And uh, I think over the last uh, month, month and a half, uh, they feel empowered to do so. Um, they're going to recognize right off the bat when this isn't safe. And I, I trust in the collective wisdom of the, the people that we've got, certainly working with, living within the city of Timmins. Um, they're not going to rely on anybody else to make them safe in a situation where they have the most uh, the, the, the downside if they, if, they, if they get sick. So I think we have to rely on that as well, because I don't think that any government, any place, anywhere can ultimately make everything totally safe. Um, the individuals are gonna, are gonna be, and citizens are gonna have to be wise enough, and I think they are wise enough to realize that they're largely the author of their own destiny when it comes to 
um, uh, working and, 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 and shopping and, and, and uh, safely within the community. I, I think we have to recognize that. All right, so one of our uh, final questions is around making our economy even stronger than pre-COVID. So I think the wording is something, more, building a more secure future for mm -hmm. Canadians, uh, giving priority to economic fundamentals that were even needed for growth and opportunity prior to um, the damage inflicted by COVID-19. So how do you think and this can be open to any of you, but how, can, how do you think we can achieve Canada's economic potential moving forward? And Charlie mentioned those lessons learned earlier, so maybe, maybe there's something in that. Well, um, I'll start off because uh, I've actually been, um, through our party, I've been asked to, to chair a, a committee looking at and talking to thinkers about how we come out. We cannot stumble out of COVID the way we stumbled into COVID. Uh, that I think has got to be the fundamental lesson that we have to actually learn some of these uh, where where we were weak and how to build stronger um, and there's a number of areas I think we need to look at in terms of our investments um, I believe there will be a major infrastructure program in place uh, because it it is one of the ways that you can actually get people to work and get money into the uh, into local economies I think it's going to be a real priority to start looking at building it more sustainably. Uh, we've talked for a long time about the renewable energy economy, but we haven't put much money into it because we've been carrying on. Well, now we have a pause. Now there's a way of thinking about this, certainly talking to people I know in the West uh, who are facing the massive collapse in the oil sector. We have to start looking at how we diversify. These are, these are self-evident realities that we need to deal with. The other area that Canada could really uh, benefit from is working to build up our IT, to build to, to build smarter, to uh, and even with the trade policies that we have, there's ways that the Canadian government can encourage uh, investment and and cr the creation of uh, the new data economy. Because right now, uh, the big the big beneficiaries are in Silicon Valley. They pay very, almost no tax to us. Uh, the, many of our businesses are at a disadvantage. I was just talking to some young entrepreneurs about these food apps and how much money is taken through these food apps that should be going to restaurants. So how do we start to look at getting, uh, using the online world that after COVID will become the reality. So much of our talk about how we run our businesses may change because of COVID. We see new ways of doing it. So we really need a national conversation at this time. And one of the fundamentals to that is we have run an economy where people have had less and less security. The fact that millions of Canadians did not have enough rent to pay one week into the COVID crisis was a massive shock. We cannot run a system where people are that um, close to the margins, where small businesses don't have the kind of backup to get through an emergency. So I think coming out of this is the national conversation. We have to be safe. We see that COVID may stay with us. We may have uh, an altered economy for some time, but at each step of the way, it needs a conversation this is why i'm really appreciative of what the chamber is doing where we're talking we're getting ideas we're learning what's happening on the ground we're bringing it back into parliament we need to have a much broader national discussion about the kind of canada that will have proper health care uh the idea that we have to send the army in to keep seniors alive and uh, old folks homes is a scandal that we should never ever allow to be repeated so it's going to take a national conversation about the kind of country we want the kind of economy that can be strong and one that can sustain a shock because covid hit us so fast and so hard um we're we're going to take a long time to recover from it do you think, uh, I see one of the questions in the question box, do you think that recovery timeline really depends on the vaccine? Well, um, George says we've been in school with COVID for about two months. And I think the one thing we know about COVID is we really don't know much about how this guy operates at all. Uh, it's been much more deadly in some areas than others. Uh, you know, we were told it was going to be a light flu. 
for most people, but that certainly don't want to be one to test that theory out. Um, it's, it's hit with staggering power in certain cities and almost nowhere elsewhere. We don't know if there's a second wave. We don't know if there's a third wave. We don't know if this is going to be endemic with this until other forms, uh, possibly a vaccine happens. I think we just have to be prudent and we, we have to let the science, as both Jill and, and the mayor have said, we're going to have to let the science really give us direction. And the one thing I'll just say finally is I, I'm really, really, really proud of Canadians. Uh, Canadians are reasonable. Canadians are smart. Canadians are not acting immaturely. Uh, they're doing their part. They're looking out for each other. They're doing extraordinary things to help one another. I mean, looking at the fire departments that are going and celebrating kids' birthdays on the street. Um, we're, we're a country that stands the gaff, and I'm really, really proud of us at this time. And we may have to ask people to carry on for some time more. We don't know yet. Yes, and I, I see one of the one of the questions is: Do we think the the new PPE uh, security at at businesses will be in place for some time? And what I'm hearing is uh, for sure those plexiglasses, the use of yeah. masks, that will be a, a public health Just concern for safe. time to come. Yeah. Yes, great. Yes, chill. We'll unmute you. Sorry, Cameron has you. Uh... There you go. I was. Uh... I was looking at my emails and as, as we're doing this program, I just got an email from Queen's Park that there seems to be some movement on the park issue. Uh, so who knows, maybe it'll be before May 31st. Uh, everybody has certainly been pushing from municipalities to chambers to ourselves and others. So I don't know what they're gonna do, but uh, we're asking them to do something that's safe and it looks like there's a bit of movement, so we'll see what happens. And to Charlie's last point, the economy is not gonna be what it was before. It didn't work for a lot of people, and we've got to make sure this economy works for people, not just large entities. And the last part is the role of the public sector when it comes to providing certain services has really been proven as essential in cases like this. And we're going to have to do a bit of a rethink about what does the private and public sector do when it comes to essential services. And the original question, I think, Keith, you, uh, I want to comment on Charlie's point I'm going to say go to school. Um, we know what we don't know. You know we, 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 we know that we know very little about this. The message has been the same from day one, social distancing, washing hands and coughing into your shirt sleeve. So yeah, does, it was, will business look different at the end of it? It will, but we'll figure out, we've got to figure out a way to get back into business, whether it's a combination of gloves or masks or, or anything else. Um, otherwise we won't survive and that's, and we have to we have to ensure that each individual has learned those lessons and will will be smart enough to, to uh, at least be six feet apart from the from the from the point of view of restarting the economy though I think there's tremendous opportunities here uh, both both Jill and Charlie have talked on this there's tremendous opportunities at these supply chains um, there's there's going to be lots of these uh, uh, lots of these essential goods that are that have to be and will by definition be built in in Canada. Um, we don't, you know, I, I'll take a little bit of issue with uh, Mr. Angus is talking about this, you know, the strength of our economy. It, our, our debt to GDP ratio is actually very high and we wouldn't have a triple A credit rating. We are more in lines with, with some economies that are Bs. We get a higher credit rating because our the largest uh, trading partner is the States. And if there's one thing that's been proved in this crisis is uh, that relationship uh, with this, with the prime minister, I'm sorry, with the president has been uh, severely tested. And I don't, I'm not entirely sure it'll ever change. So that's a real lesson that we have to learn um, in relation to how Canada does and sees itself in doing business in business with, uh, with, uh, with the world. And um, I, I think it will be tremendously beneficial for the Canadian economy and have more of these goods um, made in Canada. My, my, my point about the credit rating is, you know, our dollar may sit between 50 and 60 cents, and that's great. If you're an export economy and you're exporting to the world, it's a great place to be. So I really believe that there's a lot of opportunities on the other side of this. Will it look different? Yes, but there's lots of opportunities for Canadians and they're entrepreneurial. The third part about, are we gonna look different? Are we gonna be strong, stronger? is, and you know, we're all speaking from the same song, song sheet here. Broadband, broadband, broadband. We have got to build that infrastructure all across Canada. If we're gonna benefit 
all across Canada, not just, you know, the huddled masses next to the U.S. border. We have to have that built in the north. I, I'm, a, I'm, a broken, I'm a broken record on this, but, you know, there's parts of Timmins you can't even get online. And so this has to be a priority for the government. It absolutely, if there's one lesson that we've learned in this vis-a-vis -vis surviving and, and, and doing business better is that we have to be able to do it online and we can do it provided we get the dollars invested in building it. And I think it's an absolute priority. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. All right, Jill, did you have a comment there? If you just hold down your space bar, we can hear you. No, you're good? Okay. No, I'm good. Okay. I'm good. I'm good. Perfect. Perfect. So, so uh, that so is our time. I'm going to wrap us up, but I would like to uh, thank Mayor George Perry, our MPP Jill Bisson, and MP Charlie Angus for joining us today. And I would like to encourage our participants to reach uh, our viewers to reach out to your chamber should you have any business related questions with respect to COVID-19 legislation and support mechanisms that are in place to support your business. Uh, for more information, you can visit the chamber website at timmonschamber.on.ca to learn more about how your business can benefit from the government funding that is in place or get in touch with us with your questions and concerns because as you uh, have heard today uh, we bring those directly to uh, all levels of government on a very regular basis and we are happy to try and uh, be that bridge for you. I would also like to share that the results of the business impact survey have been compiled and are available for download on our chamber's website and encourage you to review those results to understand how the pandemic has impacted our business community and how we as entrepreneurs and business organizations can support each other as we enter what will be not the new normal but what will be normal uh, on behalf of our board of directors and staff i'd like to thank you for joining us we remain here for your business the recovery and safety of our community and thank you for your ongoing support of your chamber we are honored to serve and uh, we were here a month ago and uh, we thank you all for this uh, acceptance of our second invitation and uh, if we don't do this again next month uh, I wouldn't be sad, but I think it may be a, an eventuality. So uh, hopefully we'll, uh, we'll get you all back to uh, give us further updates at that time. So appreciate your uh, time, patience, and your uh, thoughts today. Thank you. Thank you.